you know, it's a style. It, it was a style. It was a style at the times. But you, you feel like if there had been a shared mission, like some sort of outside threat from communism or the Vietnam War, that our generation would have been more motivated to be outward directed. When you say our generation, you're talking about baby boomers? Well, you're in your 40s, so yeah. you're right. I'm, a, I'm on the edge of the baby yeah. boomer Gen yeah. X, but I, I, I would identify, or at least I did identify more with the Gen okay, X. Okay, and yeah. I guess I identify with the, baby the, the next yeah. one up, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, I think the Vietnam War obviously did uh, do this remarkable thing of, of bonding people together and, you know, making people, um, you know, focus on external issues and politics. And, uh, and that's, you know, absolutely a, a good thing. I think the generation that came next did not have that one thing or that one set of things and again it just it fundamentally wasn't a this is good or this is bad point it was this is a difference this generation was was more free to choose their own lifestyle their own ideas their own uh, you know there was not these big national youth trends i mean everyone called it gen x but it didn't everyone also you know, i think just that name gen x like x what does it mean like no one could actually figure out what it meant there were all sorts of um sort of uh, stereotypes about what it meant. But I, th I think when you look within the generation, you saw people doing just a remarkable amount of different things. It was very hard to put them together. They were the ones getting married at 20, 25, 35, 40, or, you know, having a house. Or starting in Internet, you yeah. know, Google. Yeah. And <laughs> they, they were leading lives in all sorts, all sorts of out-of-order ways. Um, and that, I think it was just an actual, uh, you know, I think if you think about freedom and what it means, you'd have to say, you know, freedom is, you'll see it when you see people making different choices. Like, that's when you actually are seeing freedom and not just people sort of saying, oh, like, we're the freest generation. Yeah. I want to uh, go back to a couple things. Uh, you mentioned the, the Grotto. Yes. Um, you're one of the founders of that. And for anyone listening who happens to be a freelance writer and kind of toiling alone, the, 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 the idea was to provide a space where all of you could be together, share ideas, kind of an incubator, and in a way almost force each other to start writing every day. Right, absolutely, have that social pressure um, to, to get writing. And we started it in uh, 1996 with uh, six writers in a small flat in San Francisco. And then uh, three years later got a nine-person space, and then three years after that we got a 21-person spa uh, 21 person space. And now we have 35 offices in downtown San Francisco. We have a uh, um, you know 9,000 square foot office space, and uh, we get in there every day, and we 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 treat it like a job. This grotto concept um, has really helped freelance writers find a home, motivate them to work, and even give them work. You pass That's around work. Right. So it, it helps uh, emotionally, you know, as a freelance writer, to spend all day alone is a, it's a real burden of the job. So there's a mental health aspect to it that's, that's, I think we all lead a little healthier lives. But over time, there's actually a bottom line aspect to it. There's people sharing assignments when they can't do them. But the publishing industry is a, is a tremendously difficult thing to figure out, either on the magazine side or the book side. And the amount of information that gets gathered by 35 writers, we've had over 50 books come out of the grotto. The names of agents, the, you know, the ways to negotiate contracts, the little problems you run into, the how to publicize a book, you know, all of that stuff, um, we just have this tremendous gathering of, of information. We don't do it in any formal way. This is all sort of expected to happen organically, you know, people just sharing information. The tone of the places that you share information with everyone else, you know, absolutely willingly. And it's worked out just uh, remarkably well. You mentioned your own mental health and how the Grotto helps that. Um, I understand that you're working a, on a book now about mental health in general and mental illness and how it is perceived globally. That's right. How, how we affect the perception of mental illness globally. And the most interesting part of that is that any, any mental illness is tied with culture. The, how you express depression, for instance, or post-traumatic stress disorder, or even schizophrenia has cultural components to it. When the mind is unstuck, we look around us to culture to understand how we express ourselves. So the symptomology of mental illness and culture are very tied together. And so what we're seeing today is America and the West having this tremendous influence over the way people think about mental illness around the world through the DSM, through the drug companies. Diagnostic. The, 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 yeah, the, the, the diagnostic manuals. 
research, um, the World Health Organization, all these different a aspects. We get tremendous amount of respect around the world for our ideas about mental health. Now, the most interesting part of it is that as we do that and as we help people around the world um, and engage them, we're actually changing the nature of, the, th of the thing we're treating. We're changing the nature of mental illness in both good ways and, and bad ways. So I'm trying to document a number of cases in which a mental illness is sort of um, is changing thanks to our participation. Are we making people sicker? Are we, are we telling them, you know, or creating illness where there isn't any in... in no, mental illness is, is a worldwide thing. So what we're changing is the expression. But the, the problematic part of that is that the expression of mental illness in a given culture is tied with the way a culture would heal from it as well. So when, if we were to go in and change the notion of depression in Japan from a somatic, uh, all-body, physical s symptom to... So in other words, when Japanese get depressed, they feel it all over. Uh, traditionally, Asians would, would have aches and pains and... and um, and to, to a more Western notion of depression as existential angst, uh, we may be disconnecting their, that, that expression of depression from the way the culture would naturally heal from it. But we'd certainly be selling more pills. Well, we'd, we'd be selling a lot more pills. And I think in the case of depression in Japan, that's exactly what's happened, that the drug companies have gone in there and very studiously actually thought about changing the cultural conception of depression such that it matches the notion of taking a pill to cure it. Have you found in your research places yet where people don't seem to be very depressed? No, depression is, is, is worldwide. Um, I mean, there is, there is the, the, the ultimate uh, sort of question of whether, um, I mean, depression and things like, uh, you know, ADHD and, and the overdiagnosing of mental illness within the West and within uh, developed nations, industrialized nations, um, there is the question of whether we want to be in charge of spreading that um, that way of thinking about the mind around the world, and I think we really are, you know. Um, so, you know, depression is not, there's not one, you know, it's not a clear diagnostic thing. It's a, it's a gray area, and I think uh, as we go around the world um, spreading our notions of, of, of mental illness, we're actually also spreading that notion of psychologizing people. People think about mental illness a lot more. They tend to, the diagnoses go up. But, and then again, the most interesting thing is, well, does that mean we're just changing? Are we actually seeing more depressed people in that place, or are we simply getting them to speak differently? And I, th I think more than we think, when we look for something and find it and talk about it, we're actually, to an extent, creating it. That's what extent. I wondered, is yes. if we're making more sick people. Well, I'm sure you would argue that all over the world, tribes in whatever fashion help people who are feeling down, can, can, can really provide uh, Absolutely. assistance and help yeah. that isolation when you're depressed or mentally ill is certainly spirals it. It's a, it's a critical component, and it's, it's, it may answer one of the most fascinating questions in cross-cultural research, which is why do schizophrenics in, in uh, poor countries do better than schizophrenics in the first world? And you hit on one of the key reasons researchers think that might be true is um, the social support remains uh, intact for the schizophrenic in the third world because they tend to live in very tight family units where the schizophrenic in the first world can get lost. There's not a lot of mystery to this. If people want to open the, these ties, yeah. if they were, all you need to do is talk to the person next to you on the plane, talk to you, somebody right. in the restaurant. I mm -hmm. talked to a woman, a woman in a restaurant in Chicago once who uh, became a lifelong friend. Yeah. And uh, through her met a lot of people. Yeah. And so it's doable for everybody, even if they wa don't want to do it in this fashion very intensely, you can extend your network. I think that the success you have in life, and both in terms of you know your career and your love life and the, your joy in life, often comes through the power of what you, of exactly what you said. They call the social scientists call it the weak ties. It's the people in your group that you don't quite know. They're just on the outskirts of the, your group, and those networks get lit up for a variety of reasons. When you need help in some way, when you need a job, when you need to find a romantic partner, you light up your your network of weak ties. And there is a way to, to, to maintain those and think about them and to keep that network very vibrant. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thanks. It was enjoy enjoyable to talk to you. That's all the time we have. You've been listening to author Ethan Waters, who spoke with me at the Sun Valley Writers Conference. Thanks to the conference and to Mr. Waters for finding time in his schedule for our conversation. For more information, please go to our website at idahoptv.org. And we hope you'll tune in same time next week. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin.
presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.